thank you for taking some time to listen to the Monte Carlo Report. Let me remind you that you can get Volume 1 of the Monte Carlo Report. It's been published. We're giving them out to anybody interested. Just send me an email. I want one right out to you. On this segment of the Monte Carlo Report, we're going to be going over verses in the Bible that free offer the gospel proponents enjoy using to try to establish the first point of common grace and their teaching of the free offer of the gospel. You know, we've gone over a lot of information so far concerning the free offer of the gospel. We've looked at logical syllogisms which demonstrate the irrationality of the free offer of the gospel. We've looked at verses from the Bible which demonstrate that whatever God desires will come to pass because He is omnipotent and an omnipotent being by definition always gets what He wants. But there's a lot of people who adhere to the free offer of the gospel that they'll say to me, they'll say, you know, Monty, I know you've gone through this information, but hey, people like John Murray have pointed out verses that they base the free offer of the gospel on. When are you going to go over these verses? Well, that's what we're going to do in this segment. We're going to look at verses which uh, individuals like to use, such as John Murray had used in the past, uh, Louis Burkhoff had used in the past. And we're going to look at these verses which they try to use to establish common grace theory. And we're not only going to disprove their interpretation of these verses, but we're going to show how these verses actually support basic Calvinism, the basic understanding of absolute predestination, that God only desires the salvation of the elect, and He desires the damnation of the reprobate. The first two verses that we're going to look at comes from the book of Ezekiel. You'll see this commonly uh, used whenever you argue with someone who is teaching the free offer of the gospel. They love to throw out the verse uh, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 23, and chapter 33, verse 11. Let's go ahead and read these two verses, and then we'll go ahead and talk about their interpretation and what the correct interpretation is of these two verses. The Bible says, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23. The Bible also says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel Chapter 33, verse 11. Teachers of the free offer of the gospel and common grace maintain that these two verses demonstrate God's ardent desire for the salvation not only of the elect, but also the reprobate when they too hear the preaching of the gospel. And that God has no pleasure in the death of any person who is wicked. He would have, he would desire all of them, reprobate and elect, to repent and believe the gospel and be saved. This is their claim. Well, the first thing I just want to point out in this interpretation of these two verses is how the teachers of the free offer of the gospel, teachers like John Murray and his little track, the free offer of the gospel, love to use this word ardently when they describe God's desire. They want to say that God ardently desires the salvation of the reprobate. And this word in itself is blasphemy because it attacks the Calvinist understanding of the impassibility of God. Calvinism teaches a doctrine known as the impassibility of God, and that doctrine simply states that God does not have passions. He does not have emotions, because emotions and passions are changing, they're unstable, they're subjective, and God is eternal and immutable. So to say that God ardently desires the salvation of anything, to say that God ardently desires anything is to imply that he is a passionate being, uh, a being of emotions and passions. And despite what most people today think, God doesn't have emotions. He is impassable. And so John Murray, when he taught this in his little tract, The Free Offer of the Gospel, he turned his back on the Reformed faith at this point. You'll never read an essay, a sermon or commentary. You'll never read in the Institutes of the Christian Religion where John Calvin talks about the emotions of God, uh, the passions of God. No, Calvin, as the reformers who followed him, taught the impassibility of God. So this idea that God is here 
ardently desiring the salvation of the reprobate is false. It's the first thing I want to point out about these two interpretations that you hear over and over again by teachers of the free offer of the gospel. Uh, the next thing that needs to be pointed out is that the context of these two verses do not support the idea that God is here speaking of elect and reprobate. As a matter of fact, the context supports that God is only speaking of the elect, the true church, the invisible church. God does not desire any of his elect to perish, but for all of them to come to repentance. And to make the claim that here we see God desiring elect and reprobate both not only contradicts latter parts of Scripture which more fully explain God's desires of, uh, toward the elect and the reprobate, but it also contradicts the immediate context of these two chapters found in Ezekiel. So let's just consider chapter 18, verse 23 of Ezekiel for a second. We have two rhetorical questions in this verse. A rhetorical question is not a question, it's a statement. So we have two propositions in this verse. The first proposition is that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The next proposition is that God will have the wicked to turn from his ways and live. The word death here in this verse is not a mere physical death, but it's talking of eternal death. And thus the word life or live here in this verse is not just a mere earthly life, but we're also talking about eternal life here in these verses. So with all of this in mind, let's just stop and think for a second. Which group of people is the Lord talking about here? Which group of wicked people is the Lord talking about here? Is he talking about the reprobates? Does God desire the reprobate to repent from his sin and believe the gospel? No, we've already seen that whatever God desires, he accomplishes. Well, does God desire the wicked who are elect? Those wicked individuals who have already been chosen in eternity in Christ. Is he desiring these individuals not to die and go to hell forever, but rather to be reborn, given faith, repent from their sins, turn unto him, and live eternal life? I think the answer is pretty obvious. The wicked here in this verse is clearly the elect. It's not the reprobate. So in both of these verses, in the book of Ezekiel, we see that the Lord truly has no pleasure in the death of His people. But the question is, who are His people? And the answer is, the elect. For individuals like Louis Burkhoff and John Murray to try to use these verses to establish their teaching that God desires the salvation of the reprobate who hears the gospel being preached, is simply to set themselves and their followers back on the path towards Arminius, back on the path towards Roman Catholicism. It is to assert that God offers grace in a general, not a common way. It is general grace, not common grace. These individuals are asserting with these interpretations of these verses. The idea that God desires the salvation of the reprobate and that if the reprobate will only believe the gospel, then he will be saved. It's Arminian theology. So there's no need to speculate in theology. Christ's death on the cross, as the Bible clearly says, is sufficient only for the elect. And guess what? It's efficient only for the elect. The reason Christ's death on the cross is only sufficient to save the elect is because it was the sins of only the elect that were imputed to Christ. The sins of the reprobate are imputed to the reprobate. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to only the elect. Therefore, the atonement of Jesus Christ is limited, and it is definite only for the elect.